Okay. Yeah, uh, Myron, we were. Yeah, we were. We're going to pick up right where that chart is, which reminds me of the keyboard. Thank you. So you should only need that one. This one? These are previous weeks. I think you already have that. Kind of have a. I never know. Some days it's like we got a full room. Huh? Uh, we'll see. Yeah. We missed our good talk there, though. Hmm? We missed our good talk there. Our good talk. Well, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know them. Has Michael been here? He was here like the first week. He was here last week. Was he here last week? Yeah. Yeah. Some, I, and sometimes people uh, just catch it online. Uh, yeah, uh, you know. <laughs> pardon me. Oh, that's right. That's right. It is fall yeah, fun fest, right. so there may be people out there uh, with that. Uh, and you know, people come in late, so that's okay. But uh, but we do need to start on time, so we got I guess got another minute. But uh, yeah. So, but I people come up to me and ask me for notes, and it's like you're taking it. Yeah, well, they're doing it online. They're never in class, so that's uh. and that's okay. That's okay. I, I prefer that somebody shows up. You don't want to be alone? No. The first, uh, first year, last year, when we started this, the first week, there was nobody. I think, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I started, I thought, well, we'll just record it and put it up online. Maybe someone came in after I started, but that first, uh, first was it you, Myron? I don't remember now. Uh, that first <laughs> semester. Now that would have been the second semester. Oh, no, that that would have been the second semester. That first semester, there was very, very few people. But finally, there was like four, four ladies that came fairly consistently. Uh, but uh, yeah. So anyway, well, we should probably go ahead and get rolling here. So uh, we started last week on you know, the first couple weeks were philosophy of discipleship and. Uh, kind of the underpinnings and why we do uh, what we do. Uh, then last week we started in on, did I not push the right buttons? <laughs> it's all those details. Uh, don't you love the 21st century? <laughs> Almost in the 20th century, I'm, I'm showing my age. Uh, but uh, with all the technology we have, it is great, but when it works. When it doesn't, well, then it's a problem. Uh, so we started the practical side last week. TJ, you should just need a uh, third week notes. I think you have the others, I think. Uh, no, I'm sorry, TJ, you're right. Fourth week. Fourth week. I'm a, yeah. I'm a little concerned we're not going out online, but I thought I pushed all the right buttons. But we are recording, right? Yes. So uh, if it's not going out online, it may have to be posted later. So, so this is the practical side of it, the how-to. We started that last week. We started about getting started. How do you get your disciple? Where you meet your first time and how, some places to meet. We talked about how to set up your notebook, your own, how to set up your, uh, have your disciple set up their notebook. Uh, we kind of gave you a cheat sheet for a first lesson. Uh, some of the responsibilities that you have and the responsibilities of your disciple. Uh, we looked at some of the, the getting going and how to do a meeting, uh, preparing to teach, a lot of these things, just the, the hands-off stuff. We talked about scripture memorization, how important that is, and some, uh, some uh, tricks to kind of uh, help you uh, develop a, a, a system for uh, memorizing scripture. 
And there's something you kind of have to, uh, again, I always call it a lost art, uh, hide, hide the word in your heart. Uh, so we need to not only do that, but we want to obviously, obviously encourage our disciple to do that as well. Uh, we talked about a little bit about the uh, ministry, discipleship ministry mind step, step, set, and then we talked about some strategic details on discipling. And that brings us up to this chart. I think that's where we left off. Okay, so if you can find that chart in your notes, that's, that's where we're going to pick up today. So let's have a word of prayer, and we will get going. Uh, Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy for us. We thank you, Lord, that you, you've given us your word, Father, to stand upon. Uh, we don't have to, to, to uh, feel like we're just uh, figuring this out on our own, Lord. Uh, you've given us instructions, Lord. You've given us your word. You've given us the very mind of Christ, Father. Uh, may we hold it precious, Father. Uh, may we be committed to studying it and hiding it in our hearts, making it our guide for, for everything we do within our lives, Lord. We pray that this morning your Holy Spirit would take these lessons, teach us out of them, that we might be more effective disciplers, Lord, uh, that we might be able to lead others uh, as you lead us, Father, uh, to serve you, uh, to honor you with our lives, Lord. May we focus on the main thing, and that is to, to love you, to honor you, Lord, and uh, be your servants as we walk through this life, Father. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so <clears throat> this is kind of a structure that gives you all 16 lessons. You can notice in the four corners, you got the four goals. On the bottom is kind of a, you know, the foundational lessons, and it's given a one-word description of each lesson. We're going to talk about that a little bit later, but this is just kind of, I don't know, uh, charts help you kind of cement things in your mind. Uh, this is one of those things that you may want to copy and put in your discipleship uh, book so that when you're going through discipleship with someone else, uh, you can kind of give them the patterns because we're going to talk about that as well fitting things together. Uh, so uh, it's kind of an abstract nutshell of what all the lessons are. So letter B, the focus and functions. You know, the lessons all revolve around one key or central issue per lesson, as you see in that chart. chart. Um, central issue should be designated with uh, a... some sort of question. You notice all the discipleship lessons have a question at the beginning of them. And it's kind of in, the, in there as a, uh, uh, that gives you the impetus for the key uh, issue of that lesson. Uh, and then it kind of unfolds like a, a wagon wheel. You know, none of these are, uh, I'm a linear thinker, I don't know about you, but I kind of like, I like things like A, B, C, D. But a lot of times it doesn't happen that way within discipleship lessons or within life. Uh, what is it? Uh, men are waffle, women are spaghetti. <laughs> You ever heard that? You know, okay, I, had, I heard it and I had to have it explained to me uh, at one point in time because uh, men are waffles. We like things in little squares, separated and all. Women are spaghetti. It's just kind of all over, you know. Uh, I don't know which is better, but often life is spaghetti. It's kind of a, a, a mess. I'm not saying ladies are a mess. Don't get me wrong there. But it's, it, can be, it can be messy, Okay. <clears throat> So uh, everything in the lesson should uh, be uh, presented as accenting, def accenting, defining, or complementing the central issue. Uh, keep coming back to it. Uh, you know, Alan in his uh, Sunday morning messages always has a thesis. This is the thesis, and that's the main, the main thing he wants to get across. And if you get that one main thing across, at least you've gotten somewhere. You've gotten something done. Uh, a good sermon or speech is built around one main thought. A speaker cannot express a central issue in a single sentence. If he can't, he doesn't understand the material well enough uh, really to present it. So if you don't understand the central issue of these lessons, you're not going to be able to uh, really get it across properly. So you should be able to do that. You should also ask your disciple at the end or at some point in time to, for their one word or one, uh, one sentence description of the lesson. Uh, you know, I wrote those on the top of my lessons uh, when I do discipleship. I've written them in my book uh, so that it just reminds me. Uh, if you do not understand your subject properly, you certainly will not be able to communicate to others uh, so that they can understand. Uh, <clears throat> so at the conclusion of each lesson, remind them of the lesson before and the lesson to come. So you want to tie these together. <clears throat> 
de demonstrate to them the continuity. You know, it's like salvation. Well, you get saved. Well, then what's the first things, you know, you might have in your... Well, once I'm saved, does, does that mean I'm in this family forever? It's like, it makes sense. No, we want to talk about eternal security. Uh, and then once you have passed that, it's like, okay, well, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I'm going to be saved. Now, what's my next step? Well, that's baptism. So they, they all fit together, and you need to show that continuity. Each uh, lesson is, uh, the topic is broad in the Word of God. There are not exhaustive studies on each topic. Uh, but for clarity consist and consistently, we have these 16 lessons uh, to, to do, and as an out, with an outline around them. Uh, so we need to stick with these lessons. You know, there's that give and take on sticking with the lessons and the material and, and uh, addressing things that your disciple may be up against. Uh, but we want to make sure we get through these lessons and don't stray too far. We're trying to communicate the curriculum of these lessons, not give counseling sessions. Now, I will say uh, that sometimes, you know, I had someone come to me a few years back and said, you know, I'm really having some issues and kind of need some counseling. And I don't typically do counseling around here. You know, Wayne Shipley uh, oversees that ministry. Uh, and I says, well, you know, what's going on? Well, some issues in his marriage. And, and I says, well, have you ever been through discipleship? So we went through discipleship, and that can that can facilitate counseling because oftentimes those issues that people are having in their lives, it's, it's, uh, it's answered in, in, in discipleship classes or, or lessons. So uh, they're not counseling, but they can facilitate that. Uh, so uh, we can best accomplish our goal by majoring on basic biblical principles, though. Uh, and that's the most important thing in these lessons. Knowledge of these central issues is critical to understanding discipleship. Okay, so that was what we didn't get done last week. Let's pick it up now on letter C. Letter C. Let me first say a few things, just another kind of uh, side issue when you're dealing with your disciple and speaking with them. It is best to use either third person or second person plural. Now, I'm not an English major. Some of you may be very good at that. I'm always like, what's, what's that? Okay, so third person is when people, when we talk about, well, people need to do X. We don't want to tell them, you need to do this. You need to do this. You need to do that. Uh, it's really best to use second person. We need to do that because you want to include yourself within, in, you're in the same boat together. We're all in the same boat together. So we should be better at memorizing scripture. We should be better about having a prayer life. So just something to keep in mind. Don't preach to your disciple. Don't make him think, you know, I'm the guy. I got it all together and I'm going to, you know, tell you how to do it. Uh, no, we need to be in this together. So it's best to use second person plural. And also, uh, I want to iterate, reiterate how to develop your own style in this because that's, that's part of your style. Uh, your own methods, your own illustrations, your own uh, stories. Uh, that's the way you make this effective. You make it personal by personalizing it and using your... Now, again, don't hesitate to steal other people's illustrations that are good. Uh, I've certainly done that. But you need to roll it in your life experiences in it. How do you do life? Keep notes as you go along. Uh, you know, I, my, yeah, I always, uh, my cell phone's over there. I tell people half my brains is, is in my phone, and it kind of is. Uh, but I use it to take notes. I have all sorts of notes in my phone. So, you know, we used to have little, everybody have those little spiral notebooks, you know, that I used to have in my pockets, the little tiny ones, you know. Uh, and then I would lose them. I, I, I don't use those anymore. Uh, I, I, it's all on my phone. So, you know, put little things in your, in your, in your phone is to... Well, that would make a great illustration. Uh, you know, uh, artists, they have a sketch pad that they kind of keep with them all the time. Musicians, people that write music, they hear things in there. Oh, you know, get that down on paper because you'll, you'll forget it. Uh, so, you know, and I will say this over and over again, write notes in your Bible. You know, I will continue to encourage you to get a, what I would recommend is a wide margin Bible that you plan on keeping for, for most of your life, if not all of it, that you can write notes in so you can refer back to those notes. Uh, and, and, you know, I know electronic Bibles are great. 
You know, I use one all the time, and you can put notes in them. I was always fearful that someday those, that program that I'm using is going to be discontinued or whatever, and oh, all my notes with it. So I don't know, that worries me a little bit. But if you have it written down, you're not going to lose it. Okay, <clears throat> so handling questions, issues, and problems. Let's get on the right, the right screen here. Okay. So, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, that is our theme verse for discipleship. Uh, new Christians are babes in Christ and will naturally have questions. They're going to have questions. And as the mature discipler or mentor, you should uh, refocus them on the topic at hand and don't let things get too far astray, out of control. Uh, Every question deserves an answer, so we can't refuse to answer questions, but ca by carefully handling, we can refocus those questions on the objective at hand so we can communicate the main points we want to get across. And sometimes they have to be deferred uh, till after the presentation or sometimes referred to the pastor. It's kind of like uh, uh, your kids. Remember... Uh, you know, I used to oversee children's ministries, and especially the toddlers, it's like they'd be doing something you didn't want them to do. What did you, what did you do? You, you know, yeah, you can get after them, and you know, you can punish them or whatever, but redirect. Redirect them to what you want them to do. So, well, you know, you don't, you know let's, not, let's look at this. Isn't this cool? And so you need to redirect your, uh, your disciple uh, back to the lesson and answer questions in a way that brings it back. Any lesson can generate questions, some more than others. Uh, the answer to virtually any question will often be restatement of the central issue or the focus of the lesson. Uh, sometimes, you know, you have questions because you're really not quite getting uh, what the lesson is all about. But there are times when, you, you know, you may have to say, well, let's answer that later. Uh, we call, yeah, sometimes we call them parking lots. You know, in our pastoral meetings, sometimes we say, well, let's, let's parking lot that. Yeah, and we'll come back to it. The problem is we don't always get back to it. But uh, you should write those things down and come back to them at a more convenient time because we don't want to get... You know, I, again, it's a balance. Sometimes you, you need to. You know, if your disciple is coming in in tears and got issues, well, you might have to address that, address that before you can have an effective lesson. Uh, but we want to get through the lessons and focus on them. Uh, do not answer questions that are dealt with in future lessons. Uh, don't get ahead of yourself. Just say, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Unless there's something pressing, that you, the reason you need to, uh, you know, keep coming back to where you're at, to the foundation. Uh, have them write questions down in their notebook uh, or issues that you can deal later with. Uh, we have to be aware of our ADHD uh, culture. Uh, because we are like, there's so much comes at us, uh, and we uh, rabbit trail, and, and we kind of, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, anyway, I've, I've been accused of that. I don't understand that, but sometimes. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, if you get outside these lessons and start answering questions, the natural result is to spark even more questions, and then you get further afield, and it's harder to get back. And sometimes you end up in, in controversy when you're talking about those things. Um, it's a little bit like soul winning. When you go out to, to soul win, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, you know if you'd have died, and you know, do you know where you spent eternity? And it's like, well, you know, what about abortion? And, you know, well, what about, you know, uh, you know all those things that happened in the Old Testament, you know, those are side issues. We, let's focus on the main issue about you and your uh, salvation, and where are you going to spend eternity? Same thing in discipleship. Let's focus up on what we need. Don't end up in the weeds, uh, we need, because that can def defeat the, the purpose of our presentation. Now, uh, we often say there are no dumb questions. I know there are, because I've asked many dumb questions. <laughs> but if, if they're sincere, you know, questions really aren't, aren't, aren't dumb. Uh, there, uh, you know, there may be foolish ones, and those are insincere ones. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, uh, 23 through 26, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes, 
And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may co recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. So there are some foolish and unlearned questions. People just trying to get you off, off base, off track. And, and they aren't really sincere. They're insincere questions. So uh, there aren't stupid questions or dumb questions. But if they're not sincere, then, you know, let's not deal with those. Uh, so in answering questions, never argue or take contention personally. Uh, you know, uh, Titus 3 talks about that. We're going to uh, get one of these verses here in a moment. The whole, whole chapter t addresses that. Uh, you know, you are, you are in the position, so to speak, of a parent. So we need to act like that and not continually argue. You know, parent-child relationships can sometimes uh, devolve into just, you know, arguing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Are you getting anything accomplished? No, not really. Uh, and we don't want it, that to happen in discipleship. Uh, uh, you cannot jeopardize their spiritual gr growth just to win an argument. What, are we, what is our goal here? Our goal is discipleship, not to show how smart I am and how I'm going to straighten you out. We want to get discipleship acro across. Uh, if you see this is uh, the possibility of it coming up, we'll nip it in the bud uh, by deferring the pastor to, or the disciple uh, to a leader, a pastor. Uh, you know, if, if it con continually goes on, uh, you know, you, you, you don't want to get into arguments. It's not going to be helpful. Uh, you know, so sometimes you just need to change the subject so that you can get back to the lesson. So tips and texts for keeping on track. Uh, have disciple keep questions in their notes while you're teaching and save them for the end. You know, I think that's a good recommendation. I don't always do that because sometimes you have to explain something in the moment so they can understand before. Or you can go on, uh, but if you know if it's a rabbit tail question, again, have them write it down. Uh, defer questions that will be answered in a future lesson until the time you get there, and generally that is true. Sometimes, you know, you do need to address it. Uh, these are general rules, uh, but we need to focus on the lesson so we get through them. Uh, Titus three two says, "To speak evil of no man, be no brawler, but gentle, showing all meekness." unto all men. We need to be winsome. I don't know how, uh, if you all are familiar with apologetics, which is uh, something that I, I really like to get into, uh, where you're kind of giving the undergirdings of the faith, why we believe what we believe. Uh, and you have to do it in what they call a winsome way. You know what the word winsome means. It's, you know, you're trying to draw them in. Uh, to the process. Uh, you know, you can go out and I've seen some uh, people that do apologetics that just want to go out and argue with people. Well, you're really not accomplishing anything. Oftentimes, uh, in a debate, uh, the winner of the debate may not be right. They're just a better debater. Uh, you know, and in, in I know in high school, sometimes on the debate, debate teams, okay, you argue this side, you argue this side. And then they'll switch them. You argue this side, you argue that side. Because it's really, you're trying to learn debate. You're not trying to uh, prove that you are absolutely right. The same is true in this. Uh, we don't want to just win the debate. And we want to get the facts out. out. Uh, so argument, argument is, is not a, a good way to do that. Never use a question as an excuse to write a personal political, or preferential hobby horse, uh, even if they're on your side on that. You know, <sighs> politics, wow. Uh, you know, it, that is a very self-centered attitude when you have to get your point. You, know, do we, you ever run into people like that? It's like, boy, they got to get their point across and come hell or high water, you know. <clears throat> uh, and, you, and maybe you're right, but your disciple might need to mature some first before you get to that point. Uh, so you may have to sideline that issue until they've learned more. You know, again, we don't teach everything you know uh, because your disciple may not be re ready for that. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.14, of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. So don't 
put out words there that aren't going to be profitable and actually are not good for your disciple. Uh, you know, things like evolution. It's like, okay, we're in discipleship. We weren't really addressing issues like, well, what do you think about evolution? Well, we'll talk about that some other time. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about dispensationalism in uh, uh, second semester of, of D2. Uh, D1 is not the place to talk about those sort of things. Uh, so, never argue. I maintain a humble, humble and teachable disposition throughout the whole process. Uh, you, yours, theirs, those opinions don't matter. You know, what does the, what does the Word of God say? That's what, that's what counts, what the Word of God says. Now, sometimes we disagree over what the Bible says, uh, but that's the reason we get into Bible study, so that we can nail those things down, and we're going to learn tools on how to do that. Try not to answer questions uh, you are not sure you know the answer to. Uh, you know, I've gotten in those situations and, and the deeper we get into that question, I feel my blood pressure going up because I think, oh, I'm not sure where this is going or whether I can f properly answer this. So sometimes you just have to say, you know, I'm really not sure. Uh, I'll get back with you. I, I think I told you last week, sometimes I like to tell the disciples, says, okay, you study that out this week. I'll study this out this week. We'll get back together and we'll talk about it then. Just again, don't be careful not to rabbit trail. Uh, too much. Uh, when covering a D1 lesson, teach the material first and answer questions. Second, and again, that depends on the question, uh, problems you cannot deal with, set up a time, uh, set, up, uh, the, set up the line by notifying, send up the line, I'm sorry, by notifying your, uh, your discipleship leader. And typically that is going to be your class leader. Okay, so tying the lessons together, time together. Uh, they're not only designed as a wagon wheel, uh, but they are also sometimes looked at as like a brick wall. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.10, to, to be a successful disciple, you must build upon a, a foundation as a wise master builder. Uh, they, you know, each one of these disciple lessons is like a brick that you build upon your foundation, and our foundation, of course, is Jesus Christ. Now, you can't just stack up bricks. Uh, because if you just stack them up, they're going to be easily to be pushed over. You need mortar to tie the bricks together uh, and a solid foundation. We have the foundation, but they can, you know, wind could just blow those over uh, if we don't tie them together. So the, the, the 16 lessons build on each other, and you, as you move from topic to topic, you've got to tie them together and help them understand. That's the mortar that brings them together. Again, this is, this is a metaphor that you can use with your disciple. Uh, and so we've got some suggestions uh, here. Uh, you know, we need to have connecting links, a logical flow, stories and illustrations. Uh, so when you, tie, uh, uh, when you tie in a lesson not yet taught, simply mention the connection and then drop it and go on with your lessons. Like, for example... Uh, Lesson one states that, you know, a good father has a plan for his child. Okay, well, that subject is dealt with in lesson seven, the will of God. So you could mention the tie-in, but you don't spend a lot of time developing it. You want these to see that, how they fit together. Uh, you know, that creates curiosity as well. It says, okay, well, we're going to get to that. You have a good father. Uh, we're going to talk about the will of God in lesson seven, how he, your good father deals with you. And, you know, so it, it creates that curiosity. Don't hang a brick in midair. Uh, we need supporting bricks and mortar uh, that have, you know, that may have not been laid yet. Don't steal lessons from a, uh, key points from a future lesson. I have been guilty of that. It's like I start get excited and I start bringing in things that are in later lessons. Um, leave it to develop properly uh, and, and, and in order, uh, you know. <laughs> You know, you don't want to get through 16 lessons in the first couple of weeks, and it's, you're, you're, kind of, you're kind of done, and you really didn't cover them properly. Now, a reputation is the cost of learning, so I understand that. But don't get too far ahead of yourself. Don't go too far too fast. Uh, when you uh, tie in a lesson previously taught, you can take the time to develop it if you wish, because all the supporting bricks have been put there in place. Uh, so if you're teaching lesson seven, on the will of God, you can remind the disciple how, remember, in lesson one we talked about, you know, you have a good father that has a plan for his son. 
And so you can tie those together uh, again. Uh, repetition is okay, uh, but don't get too far out of the lesson that you're in. Look for every opportunity without being excessive to tie 16 lessons together into one unit. You know, bring them together, whether they're going forward or backward in the lesson. See how they, they are 16, but they make a whole. They should be done in an order, but they all tie together. Uh, close your lesson, closing your lessons, always give an opportunity, have an opportunity to tie in the, the present lesson with the next one. Uh, and I typically, when I'm doing discipleship, I'll say, okay, we talked about, uh, you know, the Word of God this week. That's God talking to us. Next week, we're going to talk about prayer. That's you talking to God. And just tie them together. A common mistake is at the end of the lesson, you don't know what to do next. And, uh, you know... You, you just say, okay, you guys remember Porky Pig? <laughs> At the end of the, uh, end of the cartoon, there you go. Could, could, could you do that again? I can't do it. That's all, folks. Uh, we really don't want to end our presentation that way, okay? Uh, we want to tie things together. Create a segue as an on-ramp to the next highway. Uh, you know, we do that in TV. Now, I'm an old person, okay? So I watch the news every night. Uh, anybody watch, you know, yeah, okay. Well, I won't say you're old, but you do watch the news, okay, Sally? Uh, uh, World News Tonight with David Muir. Okay, you watch that? And what does he do when he comes on? In the first couple minutes, he goes through every story they're going to do, okay? I tell my wife sometimes after the first couple, well, we've seen it all. Uh, uh, in the first five minutes. Uh, but then, you know, he'll go through some stories and then they'll go to a five-minute commercial break and come back with a one-minute story. I've never figured that out. But, but the tech, they do this all the time in, in TV. Is like, okay, you, you kind of build, ex you build excitement and you, you kind of say what you're going to go over and then you go over it and then, you know, we typically re will review at the end. Uh, you watch these real crime stories? We watch those 2020, some things like that occasionally. They can take 15 minutes, maybe 30 minutes of material and stretch it into two hours, okay? Uh, sometimes that gets a little tedious. We don't want to get tedious in our discipleship lessons, but we need to do something similar because, again, repetition is the price of learning. Uh, you know, so close one lesson by introducing the next one. Uh, take a major principle from your lesson and a major principle from the next and, and apply them order, bring them together, together, show why one lesson follows the other. Uh, there's lots of ways to do this, uh, you know. So, so use that, use that to tie them together. Emphasize how constantly, con emphasize constantly how the lessons build on each other. You know, it's a, it's a single uh, unit of 16 pieces, you know, as such. No single lesson is more important than another. You know, now you could argue that the first lesson on salvation, well, that's, that's pretty important. Uh, all of them important. Uh, and some lessons are more difficult to teach. And some are more difficult to receive. But they all are important and carry equal weight. So you have to understand how they fit together. So some tips on uh, tie-ins, some tips. Uh, write tie-in notes in your lessons that remind you to refer back to past lessons or go on to future ones. So write those transitions, and I, I can see them in my mind at the end of my discipleship lesson. How, okay, just say this, that we're going on, you know, next week we're going on to, to prayer. We just, so write those things and why you're making those connections and how, how they all fit together. Uh, so uh, give them a socket to plug into. Always introduce a lesson as it relates to the previous one. So, for example, uh, with starting lesson two, now that we've learned about our new relationship with God as your Heavenly Father, we're going to learn how you can never lose that relationship. Take every opportunity to show how they fit together. Uh, so, like I say, we talked about lesson uh, four and five, the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Okay, how those two together. Uh, lesson 15, uh, how that relates to the lost world. 
Uh, how does lesson three on baptism uh, tie to lesson seven? Because, you know, well, the, the lesson seven is the will of God. Well, it's God's will that we be baptized. So all those things that tie in together. The more you think about this, the more you will see it and be able to convey that to your disciple. So look for them. You have to look for them. We have to be intentional about things sometimes, don't we? Look for those connecting points and make notes in your lessons so that you're reminded as you're going through the lesson. Uh, your lessons shouldn't be just blank page. I mean, the first time you go through it, they may be. I don't know. Uh, but as you continue to disciple others, you should have lots of notes in your, in your discipleship, unless you're very good at remembering these things, and I'm not. Okay? So then I think you have a chart in your, uh, in your notes here, and it just shows the natural progression of discipleship. Again... Something you might want to copy, cut out, put in your lessons so that you can kind of share some of these things with your disciple. Uh, but you've got the goals up there, uh, worship, and then you've got each individual lesson, a, a one-word theme, uh, the basic teaching, and what the goals are for that series of lessons. And it takes you through, obviously, all 16. So when you look at that chart, Note the one word summary and the one sentence summary uh, under teaching uh, suggested for each lesson. So you can use those or feel free to, to, to make up your own so long as they make sense, make sense to you. You know, don't try to teach what doesn't make sense to you. It's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. It's like, uh, 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 you know, you'll find out in the uh, second semester, there's some things that are a little bit difficult. Remember those last semester? And it's like, okay, I think I understand this. But, I, you know, so it was a little struggle to get through some of those discrepancies in the Word of God. There were a few of them. It's like, what was that again? Had to read it multiple times. Uh, so you need to understand it before you try to teach it. Uh, so what makes a bad lesson? What makes a bad lesson? Uh, and we've got six things here. Uh, when you let the disciple run the lesson, uh, when they monopolize the time with their issues and their problems, okay, and sometimes you have to deal with those. Uh, but, uh, you know, we learn these things. Uh, we learn how to deal with things by these lessons. And so you bring it back and focus on the lessons. Uh, you know, so many people don't really want their problems to be solved. Uh, I mean, they want them to be solved, but they don't want to take the work to do that, 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 that comes with the s solutions. Uh, they want, you know how it is. I mean, we won't get too far afield here, but, you know, it's like they just want a quick fix. They don't want to fix the underlying problem. Uh, so, you know, you just, you know, letting them go on and on about their problems, it, it's, so it's good to let people vent sometimes, but you may not be getting anywhere. So don't let them monopolize the time. Uh, when you are boring and speak in a monotone with no rapport or emotion, that can make a bad lesson. Uh, you know, so you've got to put life into it. You've got to put yourself into it. Uh, number three, when you are too tied to the material and only read the lesson to them. Uh, you know, and that comes with practice. The you know, first time you go through discipleship, uh, you have to be careful that you aren't just reading it to them. Uh, you, but, you know, you will change as you get better at this. Uh, that's what I always liked about my past experience as a young Christian was my pastor says, you can do this and you can do this. It just takes experience and time. Uh, number four, when you look up every single verse in a tedious fashion, that's the reason, you know, when I take someone through discipleship, I typically, we typically don't read every verse. I say, you need to read these before you come to our lesson and have reviewed them and understand them. Or if you have questions, and I encourage them, if you have questions about a passage, write it down. We'll talk about it. Uh, but, you know, don't just read them in a monotone fashion. Uh, when you do not add your own personal stuff to spice up the lesson, lessons, and, and you don't put your own personality into the teaching, that can make a bad lesson. Uh, if you give no personal examples, such as your testimony of how God has uh, transformed your life, testimonies, as I said last week, are very, very powerful. They, are, they can be the spark plug to the lesson. Uh, you know, I remember when I was a young man and started learning about 
the things in the Word of God, they had no clue were, I, clue were in there and how the Word of God fits together in such an amazing fashion. And we're going to get into that later in D2. I was excited about it. Uh, so I like to pass that on to uh, my disciple. And I'm going to pass that on to you all. You know, some of this stuff of the first semester of discipleship, too, is stuff that I'd like to say it's like, it's stuff that we probably know already. We just kind of need to be reminded of it and review it. Uh, once we get into semester two and the last part of semester one, it gets into some things that maybe you've never been exposed to. And some of that stuff is, uh, I, I think, very exciting. So that's part of my personal testimony. Uh, D lessons, D1 lessons are not linear thinking. Uh, often uh, Roman numerals uh, two does not necessarily have to follow number one. Uh, you know, it's more like the Bible itself uh, and its authors, you know, like the book of, of Proverbs, it's web-based thinking. It's more like the ladies have it right. It's more like sp spaghetti. Uh, it's like a spider web, uh, and, and they're interconnected. It's like neurons in our brain, you know, they go everywhere, they're, they're interconnected. Uh, and now it's our job to put the, you know, take the skeleton, the outline, and, and build some structure and some meat into it uh, to attach the sinews and muscles. Uh, for a robust uh, picture of how God works in our lives. Uh, and so you do that by putting your personality into these lessons. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, and if you have questions, go ahead and, and ask them. I want to make sure we get through this material this morning, but, uh, so we may have to defer some of them to the end. But if you have questions, feel free to, to say something. So develop your own teaching style, uh, fostering excellence in discipleship. Uh, so presentation presentation. Uh, in the time allotted, you as the disciple should have four things in mind that you must constantly evaluate internally how you are, if, you're, if you're getting these four areas covered. Number one, information. Information. Uh, uh, the 16 lessons are only skeletal outlines. Your job is to be familiar with the scriptures and you can put some meat on the material and this this gets a hold of of their mind okay their mind number two presentation surest way to turn someone off is to be have a poorly planned lesson to be boring uh, the main aspects of your presentations are presence personality and illustrations don't, again don't just read them the lessons. Make sure uh, they are involved with their emotions. I, something I, 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 I've come to, the, to realize is that our mind often helps us understand things. But it's our emotions, though, that gets us excited and, and motivated to do something about what we understand. So uh, you can convey the information in your lessons to your disciple, uh, but... You know, you have to get them emotionally excited about them for them to want to act upon those lessons, to make it part of their lives. So we need to involve their emotions. And in order to involve their emotions, well, you have to involve your emotions as well. God gives us our emotions uh, for a reason. Uh, and uh, sometimes they, they can lead us astray, but they can awfully, often be a tool for, uh, for what God wants us to do. Okay, number three, identification. The best lesson taught is when you have personally learned from God. Personal testimony, again, of how and what God has shown you through the lesson will make it believable. Uh, you know, this is perhaps the only true test we are sharing our life, or sh we're sharing life with life. We need to share our life with them. This comes from the heart. Uh, we need the disciple to identify with our experiences. Uh, and don't, well, we don't always want to tell everything we know about our past life to someone <laughs> sometimes but but you know we should be willing to share uh, the majority of it uh, uh, so that they can identify uh, and they can understand okay well you are kind of where I, I am now and you've 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 gone beyond that they can as well uh, number four application preaching the lesson uh, uh, and, and allowing the Holy Spirit to work, uh, to, the opportunity to work will assure your disciple has been exposed personally to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the needed application to their own life will follow naturally. Uh, so you're making an appeal to their will. Uh, so you, you know, they will want to change. Uh, 
And we want, we want to draw that out of them. I want the Holy Spirit to work in their lives. Uh, and let them understand we are dependent on the Holy Spirit. You know, we have the lesson on the Holy Spirit. Uh, so uh, don't, don't preach what you don't practice. Uh, we need to apply these lessons in our own life as well. We don't want to be, uh, come across as a hypocrite. Okay, so, so there are some resources uh, as well. And I think those are listed in uh, your notes. Uh, begin to use and show them how to use these common reference tools. Uh, some of them you may not have used. We will look at these later in D2. Uh, Treasure of Scripture and Knowledge. Uh, Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. Y'all have a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance? We were, you know, I, I, nice thing is I have it in my app, but I have several of them at home. But we were in the secondhand store uh, last week, and there's one, uh, a buck, hardback. So... I mean, sometimes they're easy to come by. So, you know, I, I, my wife, I don't think she wants it. So if anybody needs one, they are big, though. Have you seen the old exhaustive concordances? I remember, you know, when, when uh, I was a young person, uh, I wanted a concordance. And my mom went to the bookstore and bought one for me. And the guy told her, he says, you know, you buy this one. He'll never need another concordance. <laughs> and he, he was absolutely right. Kaler's. Remember Kaler's there on, in Raytown? Huh? Anyway. Uh, he was right. Uh, I never needed another one uh, other than the fact that, boy, I don't hold that thing around anymore. It's all on my phone. Okay, so, and there are several different concordances, and we're going to look at them uh, later. Uh, so there are, like I say, there's uh, some, lots of reference books there. Uh, uh, so, so, letter C. Letter C. How to teach and make biblical concepts clear. Uh, so in our hectic lives, uh, discipleship teaching time is at a premium, so clarity of, com of communication, that's what we need. Uh, that is why we have the goal of, of, of getting you to develop your own teaching style and putting your personality into what you're communicating. Uh, we have to find ways to impart life, not just transmit information. We need to get across uh, life. Never teach everything you know on a topic uh, in a lesson. Just give them the tip of the iceberg of what you have studied and, and leave some mystery because that can be good to, to kind of uh, encourage them to find out some things on your own. When I was in high school, uh, when I was a senior, we had a math class that uh, was a little, it was actually college math. So when I went to college, math was easy because I already had it. But we had this teacher called Mr. Clark. He was a sour old man. I don't know. <laughs> At least he seemed that way now. Uh, but I, I remember to this day, he, he says, well, I'm teaching you by the discovery method. Okay, what did that mean? Well, it means like, you know, he would lead you to a point. Instead of telling you what the answer was, he would lead you to a point where you would like, oh, you, you, would, you would suddenly realize it yourself. Uh, and we need to do that with our disciple as well. Lead them to the point where all of a sudden the light bulb turns on in their head and they understand what's going on. Uh, that way they will, they will remember it much, much better. Uh, rather than you just giving them all the answers. Uh, uh, this meaning, uh, means methods of clarifying concepts you have, uh, have, to be, have to be chosen very carefully for clarity, time worthiness, and ease of communication in, and impact. Uh, and there are three methods you can use with any concept to get it across to someone. First of all is restate it, okay? S explain it or define it, and illustrate it. Uh, so, you know, and everybody learns a little bit differently. Some of us are visual learn learners. Uh, some of us have to, experiential, uh, have to experience things. Uh, some of us are have, learn by association. I mean, some of us needs hands-on. So, uh, you know, sometimes it's good to know what type of learner your disciple is. You know, we all learn in every way, but some of us, other certain ways, are more effective. And Good to know your disciple, what works best with them. So, number one, restatement. A restatement puts the same idea in different words. Uh, you know, it's important for someone coming from a background of the world uh, because sometimes what we say doesn't translate from their culture. Uh, try to become fluent in synonyms. Uh, restatement has to take place with almost every concept except if a person is new to Christianity in the Bible. Sometimes we think the words we put out, we understand them, and we think everybody understands them. 
Uh, you know, I remember something Jeff Adams said years ago. He says, just because I've told you something and you've heard me does not mean we have communicated. Uh, they may not understand what you've, uh, what you've said. Uh, they may not understand the words. Restatement is different from repetition. Repetition says the same thing in the same words. Creative discipler learns the art of restatement by saying the same thing in different words. So that gives us more clarity. Uh, this is because listeners are not like readers. Readers can go back and read over the material, but if you're listening, you can't go back and hear it again if you, know, if you don't understand it. Uh, you know, Alan you, you know, says, I'm going to be, be kind and rewind. You guys know what that means, right? The cassette, you know, okay, yeah. you know. <laughs> I never had to do it, though. You, you never, never had to do it? No, right, yeah, yeah. I have a whole bunch of cassettes. I need to get rid of them. Uh, but anyway, so, uh, you know, but you can't do that when you're just listening. So sometimes you have to restate things. And again, the price of learning is repetition. Uh, they may not get it one way, but they may get it another way. Uh, we get things in different ways. Uh, so if you say something only once, it gen it's generally ignored. How many times you got to say something? You know, those of you who've raised kids, how many times have I told you? Uh, <laughs> You know, yeah, yeah, it's like on and on and on. Uh, so if you, but if you say it twice in slightly a different way, you know, and that doesn't, you know, with our kids, it's usually like, okay, raise the, the volume, but that doesn't work either. Uh, but say it differently in a different way, and that can help them mentally underline it. Advertisers do this all the time. Uh, they just keep restating their ideas, uh, you know, Coca-Cola, and they all, it's like, say the you know, same thing over and over again. Uh, I mean, how many times have you watched TV and in one program, it's like, I've seen this commercial how uh, many times? Uh, what annoys me is it's the same commercial. You know, do some different commercials. At least that way it's a little bit more stimulating. And when you do the same, do the same thing, say, say the same thing in a different way. Uh, so... All right, so let's look at the explanation and definition. Explanation and definition. Uh, we need to be careful when we use what I call Christianese. Uh, new Christians may not be familiar with some of the terms we use. You know. Now, I'm not saying you're going to use these terms, but sanctification, justification, propiti propitiation. How does Alan say that? Propitiation. <laughs> he starts putting that French accent on it. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you're speaking Greek to me. But, but we have to be careful when we use those team terms. Even things like, you know, uh, grace. We're going to talk about grace and, and mercy. It's like young Christians may not understand what those t terms really are. Sometimes we think we understand them. And when we start examining, it's like, what does that really mean? So after restating something, you can also explain or define it. A definition establishes limits. It sets down exactly what is to be included and what is to be excluded from the meaning of the words. You know, misgen misunderstandings are often the result of something having a different understanding of a word than you do. Explanation also sets boundaries. Uh, however, it does, does, uh, does so not by strict definition but by amplifying how re ideas relate to each other. Explanations involve contrast and comparison and not just definition. You know, sometimes we can understand something by knowing what it is not. Uh, by that, that's contrast. You know, sometimes you show this is what it's like, but okay, but it's not like that. Uh, I can define grace as the finished work of Christ operating on your behalf. I can restate that as God's blessing apart from man's working. That's un unmerited favor. I can explain it by contrasting it with mercy. What's the difference between grace and mercy? Well, mercy is God preventing something negative that you do deserve, like punishment. Uh, grace is by God giving you something positive that you don't deserve, like acceptance. So, you know, explanation and definition. There are at least five methods that you can use to define or explain. Consider these things as a way to add your own personality and teaching style to your lessons. So constantly go through life looking at circumstances in light of a lesson and discipleship and how it might be a good illustration and write it down. Write those things down. Keep notes. 
So, uh, A, sometimes you can define or explain through synonyms. Synonyms are alternate words that have the same meaning. Uh, they may not have a good understanding of one word, but they might have an understanding of another. Uh, B, sometimes you can define or explain through examples. Uh, C, sometimes you can define or explain through facts, uh, observation or statistics. Remember, every person has a right to their own opinion, but you don't have a right to be wrong on the facts. So if you're going to define it, uh, do it in a language the disciple will understand. Make sure you know the correct meaning of words. Uh, I have Alexas around our house. And so uh, I used to have dictionaries everywhere. I had a dictionary in my car. I keep it in my car because it's like, look, now I just ask Alexa. Uh, because there's certain words I think, I think I know what that means. And uh, Alexa, what is, you know, define such and such. And it's like, mm -hmm, all these years. And I thought, I thought it meant that. Uh, so know your words. Know, know the facts. Uh, D, sometimes you can define or explain through quotations. Uh, quotes, poems, hymns. Uh, nobody uses hymns much anymore, but uh, sometimes those things can, can make an impact with people. Uh, e, sometimes you can define or explain through narration. That's telling a story. Telling a story. Well, uh, uh, whenever Time Magazine does a spread on war, the elections, or high-profile murder trial, it does so by focusing on people, the people involved. So, likewise, the Bible is filled with narration. Uh, use this successfully and try to make the words paint pictures. Be creative. Communicate to the imagination of people. Jesus did this. If there, for no other reason, we should do this because Jesus did this. You read the Gospels. Jesus used stories. He used narration. Uh, he, he painted a picture. Uh, people get bored quickly with facts and figures, but everyone likes a good story, you know, even a short one. Uh, preachers do this all the time, and, and sometimes it just makes it click in your head. Uh, yeah. What's the difference between third and, and, and when, when people would tell those, uh, we call it par uh, parables? Yeah. Parables? Parables, yes. What? What's the difference between third and parables? Okay, so if you want the, the, the strict definition, a, a story is something that is actually happened and true. A parable is a made-up story. So when you read in the Bible, in the Gospels, yeah. Jesus told a parable. The parable uh, it was not something that actually necessarily happened. But a story is, uh, for example, and I, I, you check me out, when I, but I believe I'm correct on this. Uh, we talk about the parable uh, of uh, the prodigal son. Not a parable. I think if you read your Bible, it doesn't say it's a parable. So you have to assume that was a true story Jesus was telling. And it's a, you know, not that that makes a lot of difference, but that's generally the difference between a parable and a story. A parable is fictional. Right? It was made up. It could be fictional, could have happened, but, you know, it's not something that necessarily happened. Okay, so, uh, choosing, no, so in, in all these five methods, you have to, be, uh, have to put yourself in the disciples', in the disciples world uh, during your preparation. You know, how are they going to view this? Uh, be familiar with the subject uh, uh, that you're, tr you're teaching. Uh, be familiar with the lessons. The pitfall is the more familiar you are with the lesson, the less aware you are of the listener's ignorance of it. And that's an important point. Uh, we know these things so much and so well that we kind of want to rush through it. So we need to take uh, the, the time to make sure they understand it because uh, we take it for granted. You, you know this stuff, right? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, so you have to keep, stay on your disciples' uh, level uh, and kind of put yourself in their shoes. Uh, remember back to when you first heard some of these things and some of these truths, and, and you have to communicate them in a manner that, that speaks to your disciple. You know, we speak to children differently than we speak to adults. We're not saying your, your disciple is a child, but they, they may have little understanding of some of these concepts. Uh, they, if, if they're babes in Christ, so to speak, well, we need to speak to them in that way. You know, there's some people, we start throwing her out being lost and saved, and it's like, well, saved? Why? From what? From drowning? From what? You know, they don't even understand some of those concepts, so we have to be careful with those words. Uh, so, and often, the good way to do that is to know if you're getting comprehension on their part, is to ask them questions. Do you understand what that means? Do you, explain it back to me. 
All right, so choosing uh, and using illustrations, uh, number three. Besides restating and explaining, the effective teacher uses illustrations. How do we illustrate something? Uh, illustrations are able to restate, explain, and define all at once. Uh, they do this by relating a concept to real life. Illustrations in your discipleship teaching are like the pictures on your television set. And if you're like my wife, not only do you use illustrations verbally, she has all these graphic illustrations. Uh, they're great. And, you know, she's a visual learner. And, and I, you know, sometimes I steal them from I don't tell her that. No. Uh, <laughs> So, so uh, you do not make someone you are teaching have to sit as if they were in front of a TV, TV with only the audio going. Okay, so, uh, so visual things are great. You know, I how uh, well we do Good News Club, which is in the in the elementary schools. So it's teaching little kids. We we use as many illustrations as we can because that makes an impact on those kids when they can see it, especially in this culture and generation. You know. Um, there's so much going on uh, that uh, that's what kids expect. They expect that visual impact. Uh, illustrations make truths believable by example. Examples are not proof, but mentally they allow you to gain access, acceptance rather, for your ideas. Uh, choose your examples with wisdom. All truth is equally valid, but not all truth is equally valuable. So you want to illustrate the key points. Uh, some truth is dime truth and some truth is dollar truth. Okay, so, you know, the, especially those key points, try to use illustrations for them. Your disciples uh, need, not only, uh, not, need to not only understand the concept of discipleship, uh, but they need to know what differences it makes in their lives. Illustrations and experiences show that. Uh, you know, you need to show them what I say, where the rubber meets the road. How do you apply this in your life? We can't just uh, convey information and, and head knowledge. We need to show them how this actually works in, the life, in their life. They show the difference uh, truth makes in life. They aid in the memory, illustrations. They stir the emotions. Again, emotions motivate people. They give a sense of passion to what you're teaching. They create a sense of need. You know, I see that and I want it in my life too. Uh, they hold attention. They establish rapport. You know, we're in this together. Uh, you know, I've experienced the same issues you're going through. Uh, they allow you to realize or allow you to personalize the lessons. They let you put your personality in the lessons and develop your own teaching style. So uh, illustrations must, though, illustrate. How do we use illustrations? Uh, the word illustrate means to throw light on something, to illuminate. Uh, illustrations are like... Uh, the rows of footlights on a stage for an actor, but if the light shines in the eyes of the audience, it's too bright and it may uh, blind them to the truth that's being conveyed. So, uh, a story told for its own sake may be funny, uh, but may also get in the way and blinds the hearers to what they ought to see. So, an illustration has to be chosen for how it centers the attention on the idea you want it to display. Uh, you know, and we just used an illustration there, the footlights and the actors. So use illustrations like that, but make sure they apply and they don't distract to what you're trying to say. Uh, B, illustrations must be understandable, understandable. Uh, in general, you want to clarify the unknown by using the known. Uh, if you have to explain an illustration, well, it's probably a bad illustration. So it's kind of like the jokes I try to tell. I have to explain them. That's not a good joke, is it? Uh, your audience has to be able to put themselves in the place of the story in order to feel its force. You know, sometimes, you ever seen a logo uh, that you like, doesn't make sense to you? Well, that's a bad logo. I mean, a logo is supposed to identify you with the product and kind of be an easy, understandable thing to see that kind of, you see right away, okay, I know what that means. Uh, if they're too complicated, uh, they're not helpful. Uh, illustration literacy, illustrations must be convincing. They have to be accurate. Uh, they must not offend. The truth may be stranger than fiction, but your story should not leave people doubting if you told the truth. Uh, don't be a person that tells so many fantastical stories that you don't believe any of them. Have you come across somebody like that? They're always telling stories. It's like, 
okay, I don't know that I believe anything comes out of your mouth. Because they're always telling a story that's just like, that's fantastic. Or, or, and, and you got the, the guys usually that are one upmans you know, it's like, oh, oh, I got a better one than that. They always have something better. So uh, be careful with that. Uh, we want to make sure that they're, they're convincing, they're truthful. Uh, letter D, illustrations, I think I missed behind on my slides here. Uh, illustrations should, be, should fit the theme. Uh, God is omnipresent, but just because he's everywhere, at the same time, we don't want to say he's uh, in the toilet because, you know, okay, that doesn't, you know, that's kind of offensive. Uh, so they need to fit uh, what you're trying to get across. Uh, illustrations should fit the audience. Letter E, you do not use the same illustration in a men's conference as you would in a child's Sunday school class, okay? Uh, illustrations work best with tie-ins to the disciples' career or interests, so make it something that can, they can relate to. You know, that's why we can match, obviously, ladies with ladies, men with men, uh, so that uh, you, you fit the audience, and you want your illustrations to fit your audience. Uh, illustrations, uh, letter F, should be told with emotion. If you cannot make them dramatic, uh, then they won't have the force an illustration should have. And how do we do that? Uh, the same way, you know, you carve a statue of a person by cutting away everything that does not look like the person. I just saw something on uh, uh, Michelangelo uh, last night on carving the David, okay? And he, you know, well, he carved away. How do you get that? Well, how do you get something out of that stone? Well, I carve away everything that's not David. Uh, so and that's how we do that with an illustration. Make sure that we... Pull off the things that aren't necessary. You, you dramatize a story by cutting away all the details that do not add to the punchline and deliver it with some animation. That is what builds rapport with your disciple and keeps you from being boring. Uh, so, letter G, the best illustration comes from personal experiences. We keep going back to that. Life is a circus. At least, you know, most of our lives are. Uh, some people can gather more material in a walk around the block uh, than others are able to see in a trip around the world. So the difference is not what we experience, but what we are seeing in what we experience. Uh, so be looking. Be looking for what you can use. Keep a notebook. Keep notes in your phone. And remember how Alan's always saying something about, you know, uh, things talk to him? And it's, you know, it's like, you know, I saw, you know, that street sign. That street sign started talking to me. Uh, and, and you know why he's talking to him? Because he says, I can use that in illustration in a, in a message. Uh, and, you know, I find myself doing the same thing, too. It's like, yeah, I could use that. Uh, you know, we were, so we were watching World News last night with David Muir. And I told my wife, says, I'm using that tomorrow on my D2, <laughs> D2 teaching. So you have to be thinking about those things all the time. It's like, how can I, how can I incorporate my life experiences into uh, my discipleship teaching? Uh, so your life in this world is meant to be God's picture book. All you have to do is look at ordinary events in terms of spiritual applications. That's our problem. We get so distracted on what we're doing. We forget to, to look at things through spiritual eyes. Uh, Begin to use your entire personal history with, uh, with God as a platform to build windows into your teaching. Okay, so uh, developing practical discipleship skills. Developing practical life uh, pra uh, discipleship skills. So uh, we have a few realizations we need to look at. Uh, there are some things to consider before proceeding because you will... Uh, they will help you and meet your disciples' needs. So recognize that there may be spiritual battles taking place in your disciples' life. Uh, there probably is. We all have uh, spiritual batters, battles going on. The question is, how bad are they? Uh, so, and we got several verses there to support this. Uh, you will need to ask God for boldness and guidance uh, because your strength comes from Him to address some of those spiritual issues. Uh, recognize that whatever fear is present may be because of the pride of the flesh. And again, some verses there. Uh, your flesh, flesh hates the things of God and is, is afraid of what other flesh will think when spiritual things come out of its mouth. Why is that true? We can talk about, you know, ball games all day long and, and no problem. Those are fleshly things, not a problem. Uh, but when we start talking about spiritual matters, all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm afraid of what they might think about what I'm going to say. Uh, your spirit doesn't have a mouth, so it has to use the mouth of your flesh. Uh, that's why we need to crucify our flesh daily. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 
uh, 31. I die daily. We have to crucify our flesh daily. Galatians 6.14 says, But God forbid that I should glory, save, or accept in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. So we need to, to crucify our flesh daily. Perfect love casts out fear. Uh, 1 John 4.18 4, So as you mature uh, your love for God, your understanding of His love for you, and your love for, you understand his love for you, that fear dissipates, dissipates. Uh, and also recognize God gives us fruit in spite of our fears. So uh, we come to realize that God's will for our life should trump our own fear. Uh, so don't live in a state of fear. Recognize, recognize the word of God and the Holy Spirit must be present for spiritual communication to take place. Uh, so... If we have the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, sometimes that's all you need. Sometimes when you read a verse, what more can you say? It's like it's all, all right there. Uh, the Word of God always does the work because the Word of God produces faith in the believer. It's not going to return void. Uh, the new convert or Christian needs faith to, under, to address his or her first need, that of identity and security. That's lesson one and two. You know, I'm, I'm saved now, I'm part of the family, and I have eternal security. Always remember the way you were and what it was like before you got saved. Identify with them. Okay, recognize they sometimes have to fall on the way to learning to walk. Uh, be there to help them heal. You know, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about when do you quit discipleship? Well, and that can, that can vary greatly on uh, the process that you're going through. Uh, but just because they trip up a time or two, it's like, don't give up on them. Uh, you know, even if you never get through all the 16 lessons, what you do get through will be helpful to them. Be there to heal them, not, not to be the Holy Spirit in their life, uh, but uh, be, be part of life. Keep, we need to keep our pastor informed and where the, you need to draw them into their struggles because sometimes, uh, you, you know, your pastor may know things about that person you don't know uh, that he hasn't felt, you know, that he needs to share with you. So if, you know, if, if in doubt, talk to your pastor about what, what's going on. Uh, recognize how keeping your ears open is essential. In other words, we need to be sensitive not only to what our disciples are saying, but to what the Holy Spirit's telling us in that process. You know, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So you must hear from God. In the Bible, hearing involves both comprehension and obedience. Romans 10, 16 through 17. The Lord will let you know when it is appropriate to share what God lays on your heart with your disciple uh, you are speaking to. If you listen... If you both comprehend and obey, if you cannot hear, uh, if you cannot hear it, const if you're constantly talking, you know, if you're talking the whole time, sometimes you can't listen to what the Holy Spirit says. I, you know, I, I, I recall being in discipleship lessons where it's like they're telling me what's going on in their life, and I have to be uh, a little bit careful that I, I listen to what they're saying and don't it's like I'm, I'm, I'm sending up those prayers like God. Okay, I'm gonna deal this God. And, and I miss something. that so, so there's a balance there. But you need to be listening to the Holy Spirit. Uh, listening keeps the Holy Spirit and the Word of God in the forefront and you in the background. Uh, recognize that asking questions is a communication skill that can increase your disciples' discipling capabilities. Uh, this is very important. Don't, you know, we need to open, ask open-ended questions. Uh, questions that avoid a yes or no answer. Uh, you know, tell me what you think about such and such uh, instead of do you like such and such because they can simply say yes or no. Ask easy questions about background and interest. Uh, this is the only real way you can know if they're, if they're getting it is when you ask probing questions. You know, if they're just nodding their head all the time. Yeah, yeah. Are you getting this? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, they may or they may not be. So, uh, you know, you need to ask them what, what did you get? Tell me, tell me, tell me in your own words uh, what we just talked about. Uh, so make sure you get that participation. Okay, so who, what, when, why, uh, where, how. Okay, that's where we're at. Uh, so, and I like to think of these as icebreakers, asking these type of questions. These six words give you the basic, basics to start 
a conversation with anyone. Uh, regardless of the topic, you automatically have six questions you can ask that keeps them talking and, and you listening for the, uh, the keys to, to what's going on in their life and open the doors to communication. You know, people come into church that are visitors and always ask me, you know, it's like, oh, you know, nice to meet you. How you doing today? I always ask, and I mean, this is just mine. It's like, where do you live? I don't know why, because sometimes that gives me a little bit of information and gets them talking about, you know, themselves a little bit. Uh, you know, if they live in, you know, if they live in Lenexa, I'm thinking, so why, are you visiting here? Or are you, it's like, oh, no, I'm coming with, you know, my, my son or daughter or whatever. You get, it's just opening questions that kind of get you into their life a little bit and helps you build a little bit of, 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 of you know, connection with them. Uh, recognize that in terms of building rapport, ignorance can, can be an advantage. So you have to be curious and look for ways uh, and, 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 and in areas that they may know something about something that you have no clue about. Uh, you know, what, what do they do for a living? Uh, again, we, and be sincere about trying to understand. I do enjoy uh, finding out what other people do for a living, do for a living and, and uh, uh, you know, we're all ignorant on something. Uh, so ask something, ask them to explain something that they have experience with that you know nothing about. That makes them feel valued. Uh, and in turn, they will not be afraid to share with you when they're ignorant concerning the Bible. Uh, it puts you more on, on even ground. Again, we don't ever want to get to the point where I'm the teacher, you're the student, and it's like, now that is the relationship. And so sometimes we have to say, well, this is, you know, we don't want them trying to prove their point in the Word of God uh, that may be unbiblical. Nevertheless, we want to be on even ground. Uh, I always tell a, a disciple, it's like, I'm learning as much as you're learning. We're learning this together. Uh, we're in this boat together. Uh, never, but never let someone else's intelligence intimidate you. Uh, we really have the most important information on earth. Uh, what the Word of God tells us for salvation uh, and living the Christian walk, that is more important than, I don't care how much money, so regardless of someone's social or economic status, don't let, the, I say, don't let that intimidate you. It, it, we all know it does at times. I've certainly been there. Uh, I have learned over the years. I used to be in the, the uh, medical imaging business, so I worked with a lot of medical doctors. Uh, and, you know, at first I was very intimidated uh, by many of them because they're smart, typically smart guys and gone through a lot of college and uh, made great money. Uh, but I've learned just because you are very brilliant in one area of your life does not always <laughs> translate to other areas of your life. And so they may be brilliant physicians, uh, but <laughs> this is the truth. I've seen so many of them, brilliant physicians, fabulous careers, their personal life is a wreck. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where, you can, that's where you can help them out, and help them find their need for what the Bible says. So don't let those things intimidate you. Okay, so some actions. Actions. Be sure you model a confidence in the Bible. Develop three things in your disciple. A love for Jesus, a commitment to prayer, and a desire to learn and grow. People do not change just through information. They change through information and involvement. You know, involvement is that information in action. That's where you need to develop that emotions and compassion or passion. Yeah. A love for Jesus, a commitment to prayer, and a desire to learn and grow. Uh, you know, and you know, and I would say learn and grow in the Word of God. So you've got, you know. Commitment to Jesus, salvation, commitment to prayer, talking to him, and a commitment to learning the Word of God and growing in it. Uh, <clears throat> involve your disciple in your life by inviting him, over, him or her into common activities you would normally do alone or with other good friends. So kind of get them involved in your life. Get your direct involvement in your discipleship, disciple life by doing things on their turf. So... You know, do some things that you might want to do, do some things that they might want to do. Again, we try to match people up with common interests. That certainly does not always happen that way. 
show concern by listening uh, to testimonies, to life struggles, daily challenges, to their body, body language. Uh, you know, make it about them. Make it about them. This allows you to earn the right to present biblical solutions and to be heard by them. Be real. Uh, pray for your disciple and with your disciple. Uh, allow them to give feedback. Uh, you may want to give uh, appropriate gifts sometimes, a reference. I know people that have sometimes bought their disciple a Bible. You don't have to do any of this, uh, but you, you, know, you might want to send them just a card or a memento. Ladies are much better at this than guys are, uh, right? I'm, I don't know. Maybe some guys are, but I'm always like, oh, my wife's always like, I'm getting this. Don't you already have one of this? Oh, I'm getting it from my disciple. Oh, okay. I just, you know. I'm not good at that, but, but we should, right? <laughs> Especially when it comes to cards. It's like, any other problem, don't send me a birthday card. If you know my birthday, it's like a, nobody sends them much anymore, do they? But it's like, you know, I, I, I've not found too many things that are more worthless than Christmas cards. I hate to say it. I know. Uh, <laughs> unless, unless they have a letter in there that kind of gives, you know, their, their, gives some information about their past year and how this went. But it's like, Christmas, it's a pretty picture. It's like, Merry Christmas. Oh, thank you very much. It's like, okay, and the trash it goes. Anyway, okay. Boy, I can do <laughs> Don't send me cards. Don't send me cards, no. Just don't do it. Just don't do it. And you won't get them from me. No, no, I don't send out cards. You know, Alan sends out birthday cards to, uh, you know, I work in the office. So I don't work. I volunteer anymore. But on my birthday, I get a birthday card in the mail from Alan. It's like, okay, thank you. <laughs> What's that? I should, I should. I need to change, I need to change my attitude. <laughs> okay, so share not just the lessons, but what God is teaching you through the Word of God. Uh, do it without being preachy. Uh, ask your disciple what God has been teaching them through the Word of God and, and God's providence. So, you know, what did God show you in the Word of God this, this uh, last week? Uh, you, know, and, you know, be careful with that because... Uh, the, the first time or two you may ask them that they're like, uh, 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 because they haven't been in the Word of God. Uh, but if you're asking them, that might encourage them next week. You know, I, I really do need to, I need to be in the Word of God. Uh, we need to be, again, winsome and draw them in. Don't be preachy and bring the hammer down, uh, but try to draw them in. Be willing to apologize if a mistake is, is made and certainly be willing to ask forgiveness if something is done wrong because sometimes we can offend somebody and not even realize it. Do not be controlling or manipulative uh, or pushy or offensive. Uh, if your disciple does not understand something, exercise patience and wait for another time uh, for God to bring it up again. Uh, recognize God providentially uses imperfect situations as a stepping stone to growth. Ministry is messy, okay? But God has it all under control. Sometimes we see things happen and we're thinking, oh, why did that happen? Uh, you know, I used to, you know, back in KCBT days, uh, you know, I remember the one time uh, I got my dad to come to church there. Truman Dollar was, you know, none of you probably remember Truman Dollar. He was the pastor at the time. And what did he preach on? On giving. And I'm thinking, my dad always said, all that church, they just want your money. They just want your money. <laughs> and I took, they got him to come to church. And I'm thinking, but God, okay, you're in control. Uh, you have it. God has it in control. Uh, so we can't manipulate the situation. Understand that God uh, is in control. And uh, we need to accept that. In areas of sin or backsliding, make sure you consult with your pastor for direction and guidance. Okay. We all need help in dealing with people uh, from time to time. So don't be afraid to go to your pastor, your class pastor, whomever, uh, to give some uh, direction. Uh, this is an important one. No aspect of politics or patriotism or other personal preferences is worth jeopardizing a discipleship relationship. This country is not our main citizenship after we get saved. Uh, you know, the word, uh, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My world and home is laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Anyway, uh, we, we, you know, we are citizens of heaven. Uh, this is the country we live in, and we should be, I, you know, we're, 
I like to think of myself as a patriotic person. I have a flag in front of my house. I really have little use for politicians. I don't care which side of the aisle they come from. I, I hate to say that. Uh, but too many people elevate political beliefs to biblical truth. I am just amazed. It's like, especially in the last, I, okay, I should be careful. I don't get on my hobby horse. But in the last couple of years, and the, some of the things we've gone through, it's like people hold these, these political views of theirs as though they were Bible. Mm -hmm. I, it's like, I don't see where you get that from. Uh, we had a guy in our church in Montana, a great guy. He ran for, I loved him. Uh, he ran for uh, public office. He was a state uh, representative, and uh, but he was a die-hard Republican, uh, and uh, and he just felt like you know the Republicans were they had the God and the Bible all right. And it's like I says, I says, what what's going to happen when someone walks through our church doors that's a Democrat? Are you going to tell them? Oh, you you don't you know we don't have this is not for you. I, it's like, what does this even make sense? Uh, so we just have to be very careful with that. Uh, the Bible is sometimes twisted to fit their beliefs and not the other way around. So I, I, that's, that's kind of a hobby horse of mine. It's like I just get really frustrated with people that elevate their political beliefs to biblical truth. I have a question for you. Yeah. We think about preachers that go into politics. Preachers that go into politics? Uh, you know, if that's what you feel like God is leading you to do, uh, okay. But I feel like we have a higher calling. It's like... If you're a preacher, there is that, that, that compromise is not there. I kind of think so. And, and, and if you're going to go into politics, there's nothing but compromise. Yeah. You no, know, we need Christians in politics, i got to say. We need Christians in politics. So, I, I, you know, if you're a Christian, you want to go into politics, that, that's fine and good. Uh, however, I would say that's not a higher calling than, than what we're called to. We're called to be Christians, uh, and, you know, uh, so if you're called to preach, well, that's probably what we should stick with. But, again, I'm not the Holy Spirit in, in someone else's life. Uh, so I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, some concluding thoughts. Some concluding thoughts. Uh, ministry runs on the rails of a relationship, so the next step for anyone is a relationship. Uh, building a relationship as you disciple. That's what we need to do. The relationship to help them grow in Christ, not for what you can get out of it. Uh, in uh, 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 First Thess Thessalonians 2, 7 through 12, it talks about Paul's caring relationship for the uh, Thessalonians, and it was a loving relationship. We need to build a relationship, not a regime. Uh, they are not our subordinate. Uh, utilize the relationship to teach them about Christ, not convince them of your own convictions. Again, kind of like what we just talked about. Uh, it's not about you. It's about Jesus. Build the relationships through prayer, you know, as is stated in the Old Testament verse on discipleship below. So look at, uh, let's look at 1 Samuel 12, 23. Uh, and you are always welcome to look these up in your Bible. Uh, I, I just read them because it... Uh, again, we don't have a lot of time. But it says, Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but, uh, but I will teach you the good and right way. You know, that, that teaching you the good and right way, well, that was Old Testament discipleship. So we need to not sin against our disciples by not praying for them. Uh, you will pray for, you, love, you will love who you pray for. And you pray for who you love. Uh, so we should love our disciple. And you know, sometimes it's hard to do. Uh, you, know, you know, I've always heard that, that uh, you know, if you don't love people, uh, you, won't, you won't be a soul winner. Well, what happens if you don't love people? I mean, it's hard to love. How do you develop a, a love for people when you don't love them? Well, I think you have to ask God for that. Sometimes we really need to pray, God, give me. God, give me a love uh, for people. And God, God loved us when we were unlovable. And I think he will do the same uh, for us. If we ask for that love, he will, he will give us that love for other people. So help them in areas of struggle without dictating to them. Inform the pastor and let, let him be the one to do the counseling and make any ultimatums if there needs to be. Just some, some concluding thoughts. 
uh, help them set goals that are realistic and can be seen. We need to teach, train, and task. So teach them the bi biblical directives, train them by your example, and then task them to do the same thing in your presence. We talked about this uh, progression before, the three steps. You know, you watch me work in ministry, we work together in ministry, and then you work and I watch. Mm -hmm. uh, let them see you serve. We talked again, there's a difference between service and, and ministry, and we should have both uh, in, our, in our commitment to God. Uh, are you on time? Uh, do you make them work around your schedule or do you work around them? Are you distracted while discipling them? You know, sometimes you just need to turn your phone off in discipleship. Uh, or or do, you have, do they have your complete focus? Uh, do they see you at work in other ministries? Uh, are you supporting our church in its activities? Uh, are you reaching out to others and drawing them in? You know, Jesus uh, wash the feet of his disciples. So we need to follow his example. Uh, water the seed after it's planted. Uh, after the lesson is finished, continue nurturing the relationships. Uh, lessons continually need uh, being reinforced. Uh, celebrate. Uh, you know, I think this is important. Find reasons to celebrate uh, in your discipleship process. Uh, uh, you know, we completed lessons. If you completed a, a, a certain goal, uh, uh, you know, if, if they have a spiritual birthday, uh, you know, whatever might be going on in their life, if they have a friend that they're trying to have an influence on and, and they've uh, had that opportunity, especially if they win someone to Christ, well, boy, celebrate that. Uh, that helps bond you together in the relationship. Hold each other accountable to a fresh vision. We all need renewal from time to time. Uh, and if you run into trouble, uh, go to your your. Pass, uh, class leader uh, or uh, some other pastor to help you with those things. Don't feel like you're alone. Uh, okay, so then we, we have some things here and we'll go through as much as we really have a couple minutes. So how to disciple this, this whole appendix here. Whole appendix. And some of these things, uh, again, you may just want to cut some of them out, put them in, in, your, in your Bible, or I'm sorry, in your discipleship lessons. Uh, you know, it, it's just kind of a review, a summary of the material that we've talked about. And it just, again, it's, it's putting it, it's illustrating it, putting it in different terms uh, so that you can get it as well. Use, trying to use the same uh, techniques that uh, we're teaching to get this uh, material across. Uh, if you turn over to the discipleship study, a few pages over, uh, this is something that I would encourage you to go through. It's not a test by any uh, stretch of the imagination. Uh, but it's a Bible study on discipleship. So you have to go through this and look up these verses and get the answers to the questions out of the Word of God. Uh, so it, it kind of, we wanna, want you to make sure that you understand discipleship is based on the Bible and the Word of God, uh, not on what we just think or feel. Uh, so this study will illustrate that to you and see the biblical foundations for discipleship. Uh, the next page, page over, we have discipleship lessons objectives, and any of you that are taking people to discipleship, these uh, should be in your lessons at the end of the lessons now. Uh, there are objectives for each individual, uh, well, each goal. Uh, and you can go through these and say, well, are we getting these across? It's kind of a, a litmus test, uh, uh, kind of a... Uh, what you might call a review. Did, did we accomplish these issues? And I think, again, they should be in the back of your lessons unless you have an older set of lessons. Uh, so there's a few pages of that. And then I, I think you have, you have a page in there called Four, Four Philosophers of Discipleship. Mm -hmm. It's just a little vignette on uh, kind of what discipleship is not. Uh, but anyway, okay, so we are, we are time. Any questions uh, quickly that uh, you might have? Uh, I think uh, so we are, we are at the end, and I'm glad we got through all that. Next week we will start uh, talking about character qualities uh, of a Christian and uh, what we should, uh, uh, yeah, how, how we should be walking the walk. So uh, I'll have a new handout for you then. Okay, so let's have a word of prayer, and we will close up. Uh, Father, we thank you again for opportunity you give us 
uh, to study uh, the word, Lord, uh, to, to study together uh, and to, to understand and know how we can disciple uh, uh, folks that we can pass that on, the things that we've learned that we can teach others that might be able to teach others also. Father, we need to keep passing these, these precepts on so that we might uh, walk in, in step with you, Father, that we might be uh, the, the example we need to be to our disciples and that they might learn that and be examples to others, Father. That's how the church grows. That's, how, that's the plan that you gave us, the example you set for us, Father. May we continue uh, these 2,000 years later, Father, uh, to uh, follow your example. Uh, to be Christ-like, Father. Uh, and uh, Lord, we, we want to continue to do this till we see you coming back to, to take us home to glory, Father. We thank you that we have that blessed hope. Lord, be with us this week. Father, may we focus on, on you and serving you. And uh, may all the honor and glory be to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, Sean, do you already have next week's handout? I do not. Would you like to have it? It would be nice. I want to read let me turn this off and then I can, I can print them. <laughs>